Anyway, ethics, this is read from Hubbard. Ethics is to remove counterintention from the environment to remove other intentionness from the environment, okay? So anytime there's, and they consider anything other intention. If you want to do yoga, they, that was other intention. If you want to read books that are books that they don't think you should read, you know, there's a piece of blue sky, that's totally other, out ethics. Now, this was the old guardian's office before they got went to jail. This, I'm going to just read you this, just to, so you get a clue of how deep this was. The vital targets on which we must in what in which we must invest most of our time are one, depopularizing the enemy to a point of total obliterate, obliteration. Two, talking over taking over control or allegiance of the heads and properties of all news media. Three, taking over the control or allegiance of key political figures. Four, taking over the control and allegiance of those who monitor international finance and shifting them to the less precarious financial standard. And five, generally revitalizing the societies in which we are operating, winning overwhelming public support, and use all other similar groups as allies. That was in February 69, Hubbard wrote that. That's L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, now you didn't see that, I didn't see that. You know, it's one of these, these are like the in, the in crowd read this, right? That was the guardian's office, and they ended up going to prison. Hubbard wrote all these things, right? He wrote them. His wife ran the guardian's office, but what happened when they got busted? They come out, they go, L. Ron Hubbard never knew of those things. He would never do things like that. And Mary Sue, he sends his own wife to prison, along with eight other people. But, you know, you're like, okay, well, you know, it's just, it goes on and on, where that kind of thing, where you're just like, how can that be? But it happens. The end of OT3, I was sure I was, I was done with epilepsy, right? I'd handled all the BTs and clusters. I must be fine. So I go on another program to get off my medicine, and I end up in Morton Plant Hospital next to Flag in Clearwater, Florida, and nearly died again. That was the last time I ever tried to get off medicine. Now I'm at war with them because they want me off of it and I'm like, no way. So I continue on in the 80s helping them. They have a bunch of legal things that I was part of. Uh, Portland, they had a big crusade, a lady who sued them. And you know, overnight, we were all ordered to the complex over at the blue complex. You have to be there in a half an hour, right? We all get there. Okay, all of you are going up to Portland in a half an hour. Go home, get whatever you need. You're going to be there as long as you want. Go, right? These people are suppressive. They're trying to hurt our church. I'm going to give you an hour to get home and get back. We'll have buses. We're going up to Portland. True story. I go home. I'm packing my bags. My husband comes in. What are you doing? I said, this is like the army or something. I'm going to Portland. You know? <laughs> We're at war. So we drive up to Portland. They had 10,000 people fly in from all over the world. Travolta flew his jet in. They had Chip Korea come in. We were there for weeks and weeks. And she still ended up, she won um, a huge, millions of dollars. She won, but then they ended up twisting it and winning on appeal, you know, because all of us were there. And, you know, they do their thing where they trick people and get to the judges and stuff like that. It's tricky. It's really tricky. Hubbard had a thing called black PR. Well, actually, he had a thing called, I want to read this to you because I brought this. He had a thing called fair game. And fair game, I brought the actual thing. Let me just see if I can find it. Hang on one second because it's worth, it's worth hearing it. I feel like Lucille Ball. You know, I'm like, where is it? It's here somewhere. <laughs> I know it's here somewhere. Okay. Anyway, just everyone take a break for a second. I know I have it here. I do. Anyway, I can tell it to you. I know it by heart because I can't find it right now. Don't go. Don't leave. Don't leave. All right. Huh? I know. I should be, right? You'd think so, right? I'm OT7. What's wrong with me? Right? Isn't it amazing? But it, though you actually get worse and worse as you go up this pyramid of OT stuff. You do. I mean, your memory's worse. I gained 100 pounds on OT7. No kidding. I lost 60 of it. But I was a wreck. I was living wreck. Look at Kirstie Alley. She's OT7. You know, it's like that's, you, you see these people come around the corner. They're like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Like, what happened to you? You know, they're on OT7. You know, I don't know what it is. You have to be sessionable all the time. You have to eat all the time. And plus, you're stressed out because it's not working. 
So it's one of those things that it moves along. But anyway, here's Fair Game from L. Ron Hubbard, 18 October 1967, penalties for lower conditions. Anyway, he has liability, treason, doubt, enemy SP order, which is what they have on me. I showed it to you. Fair game. May be deprived of property or injured by any means, by any Scientologist without any discipline of, of, of the Scientologist. May be tricked, sued, lied to, or destroyed. L. Ron Hubbard. Now, I've stood up in court and said that's not true when people said that about Fair Game because he wrote a cancellation of Fair Game. But the truth is at the bottom of the Fair Game, which Scientology wipes out to us when we were in, this does not apply to suppressive people, the cancellation, right? So they can still lie, cheat, steal, destroy people utterly. I didn't know that until I got out. And, and I'll tell you about what happens there. But I still want to keep moving up the line. So they have a bunch of, as he said, as Vaughn said, they have legal situations all the time. It's one of their biggest things is suing people, taking them to court, trying, and it used to work for years, because see, they would declare someone a suppressive person. Nobody could talk to you, so you lose all your friends overnight. And who would believe this story? You know what I mean? You, you'd start telling someone and they'd think you're nuts. So people would literally leave and just kind of be off. And I mean, I've talked to people. It was a really sad time for them. But now, thank God because of the Internet and thank God because of what we call critics who are free speech advocates, who are basically exposing Scientology around the world. People, you know, I can now say to you this story and say, go read it on the Internet because it's there with all the documentation. So it used to work, but it doesn't work now. And, that, and Hubbard never planned on it. as much as he was so brilliant and he thought of everything. He didn't think about the Internet, and it is taking them to the cleaners, I'll tell you. <laughs> so anyway, David Mayo was Hubbard's personal auditor and helped write one of their top, top levels called Knots, and which is like new era, whatever, it's for OTs, for operating Thetans. It's like Dianetics for OTs. And David Mayo wrote that and helped write it and worked with Hubbard. And then in 82, he ended up being declared a suppressive person. Now, again, people like me when I don't want to hear about it. I don't, don't tell me about it. I don't want to know about it. I, I know he's bad. It has to be. You know? But I knew he wasn't bad because he'd helped me personally. So it was a weird thing to me. So I went to the executives and I said, I don't get it. You know, it's like all these really good people. I mean, a lot of people left Scientology in 82. A ton of people. And I said, why are all these people getting declared and leaving? And they said, you know, we have this secret tape that most people don't get to hear, but we're going to let you hear it. So, again, I listen to the tape, and it's Hubbard saying, you know, if you're an executive, by the nature of your business, you're going to commit what he called overts, which are bad deeds. Because you, can you can't make everybody happy all the time. So, basically, it kind of explained it to me a little bit where I could say, oh, okay. So, they ended up, and he said, it's up to the public to make sure they get security checked. Now, security checking is where you're sitting with someone, you say, this is not auditing, I'm not auditing you. And you basically say, you know, have you ever stolen any money? Have you ever said anything bad about L. Ron Hubbard? Have you ever, you know, stolen any materials? I mean, it's amazing because we were at the top of OT7. We had to go back two times a year, every six months for a six-month check. And they would rattle off all these questions. Have you ever stolen any materials? Have you ever, you know, done this? Have you, you know, and we're like, we're the top in Scientology. Why would you keep asking us this stuff? You know, it really gets old, and you have to pay for it. It's $7,000 every 12 and a half hours. So that adds up. All right, so anyway, I'm moving along. I'm almost done, because I can see you guys. It's a lot, you know, I could go on forever and ever. But what happens is, I basically, in 1990, got onto, I went to the Flagland Base in 89. I'm, you have to go through a routing form every time you go through the church. I go through the routing form, and I get to a 15-year-old Italian kid, and he, who's the ethics officer. And he opens up my folder, and he goes like this. You are not allowed on the flag land base. <laughs> and I go like this. Are you talking to me? <laughs> and I just keep doing that over and over. Are you, I do the taxi grab thing. And in my head, I'm ready to dive over the desk and strangle him. But Scientology would say that's an evil purpose, and I didn't want to get in trouble. So I just tried to be cool, and I just kept doing the, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? And finally they bring the head person, and they say, okay, that's not right. You know, it's true. You know, you've done a lot of contribution. You've helped out a lot. We'll allow you on the flag land base. I'm like, okay, great. So anyway, long story short, it all ends up getting back to, I got to get off my medication, right? And I finally say, you know what, that's it. I'm not doing it. 
I want to write the head guys who are now these top people that are running the church. Hubbard has died, which I forgot to get into, but he died in the meantime. And David Miscavige took over. And these people are now running the church. And I write to them. I've written to them and said, you know, different things. So I write to them and say, this is wrong. I, you know, my doctor says I should take the medication. And he's a Scientologist. It, it's not a mind-altering <coughs> drug. You know, come on. Let's, it, it's okay. And they finally send all my folders up to the top thing. And it takes a month. And after a month, they wrote a thing saying, okay, if you have to take medication and you tried to get off and it didn't work, you can take your medication. So now I'm allowed to do OT7, and I get on it, and it doesn't work. I mean, I've heard what happens is you're in the church, and you hear, like, true story, this guy, Barry Klein, would say, well, I healed so-and-so's broken arm. And you think, really? You know, on OT7? And, you know, I healed this, and I healed that, and I went in session. And, you know, when we were in Portland, oh, the police weren't there. Well, that's because the OT7s are auditing the police. Right? They would say that. When the Berlin Wall went down, they announced at an event it went down because OT8 came out. <laughs> True story. Now, they, they have many magical powers, except they can never handle the bad things, right? You know, like the real things. Like, what about Iraq and Iran and all that shit? Well, that doesn't, you know, we don't have enough OTs. That's the problem there, right? If you were out doing more, we would. <laughs> So anyway, it, it ends up, I start waking up once I get on OT7 because it's not working for me. And it, and it goes on and on and on. Finally, my best friend and auditor starts working with the Office of Special Affairs. Because these, what happened was some Scientologists left Scientology, they got on the internet, and they started telling secrets about Scientology. And just not like they're telling secrets, they were just talking about things that happened. But to Scientology, they saw it as they were telling their secrets. So they needed to cancel it. So they enter a cancel, cancel command trying to cancel the entire news group. And I've met people around the world who either saw that or read about it, computer people, and they went, you know, not on our watch. We don't know anything about the Scientologists, but you can't cancel anything on the Internet. Well, Scientology went, oh, really? Well, we're going after you. And they bankrupt two people. Well, more people, you know how the Internet is, they're just writing it and telling what's happening and it's coming up. And now more people are like, that's not right. You can't do that. And now they just keep doing it and more people keep getting on saying this is against free speech. It, you know, they sell freedom on one hand, but on the other hand, they enslave people. That's what they do. It's a truth. It, that's the truth. And, and they trick you and they shut you off so you can't think and you can't talk. Well, now I'm at the top. I can't talk to anybody really about anything that I care about. I can't really think much of the BTs and clusters will read on the meter and then I have to spend all the money, right? So I'm like, okay, don't think, you don't even think about that. You know, for anything, you know, anything that might be something that they might read on in the next six months, I'm like, I'm not thinking about that. I'm gaining all the weight. I'm a mess. I'm just a complete mess, right? And I start waking up. And I, my friend says, look, I want you to go on the internet and find these bad people who've posted our, our confidential materials. So I said, okay. And I'm really afraid of the internet because one of my friends went insane. True story. And my, my best friend, Bill Yachty, said that she went insane because she read the internet. Which I know it sounds ridiculous, but you know, when you're in the show, it was like, wow, really? I mean, she was like jumping out back windows and she was a mess, right? So I was like, well, okay, I'm not looking at the internet. That, I don't need that. Plus, you've got to remember all the, you know, the, the, the money going, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching for anything that you get into that might not be cool, that gets, upsets you, then you've got to pay to fix it, right? So I'm just like, okay, I'm not reading the internet. But now I'm on the internet, I'm typing it in, nah, it's on Google, right? And I don't really know how to do the internet much at this time, and all of a sudden up comes Operation Clambake. And it's this thing from my friend now over in Norway called Xenu.net. It's a huge website. And he's a computer geek. He had read this thing about them trying to cancel the news group, did his own research, found there were little bits of information all around the Internet about the other side of Scientology, but there was nothing with it all coordinated at that time. So he created this website called Operation Clambake, www.xenu.net. And with that... I'm like, this guy's the devil, right? <laughs> and I call up boss, I go, why don't you get this guy off the internet? He's a mess, right? Yeah, we're working on it. Okay, so move on. I become the ED of their Scientology Parishioners League. And they get with me and they say, look, we need you to help us again. Um, we have all these critics that are, you know, oh, oh wait, sorry. One thing in between that. First, Bill 
says, I find the Operation Clam Deck, right? And he says, okay, you know what? We have a top secret thing we need you to do. Again. Um, we want you to go open up a phony account. And I say, why? And I, at this time, I don't really know much about the internet. And he goes, don't worry, it's totally legal. We can't tell you why, but we just want you to do it. And I'm a, I'm a sap. I go, okay, I do it, right? And I get it opened up. And he comes back, and he's got a grin like I've never seen the guy grinning. And he goes, you know what, Tori? You have changed the history of the internet. And I'm like, again, Homer Simpson, how can I change the history of the internet? I don't even know what it is, right? <laughs> But I don't say anything, and so now I'm invited into a top secret meeting with the executives of the Church of Scientology, only one of them. And there's only five people that are part of this top secret OSA Int mafia, basically. And, but they don't call it a mafia. They say it's a top secret thing. You have to sign this piece of paper that if you ever tell anybody about it, you have to pay us $100,000. And I'm like, I look at Bill and I go, you know, this sounds like the old GO days, right? That's the kind of stuff they used to do. And he said, no, no, trust me. Tori, look at me. You know, and remember the guy with the lines? You know, he's like, trust me, I'm your auditor. Would I ever do anything like that? And I thought, nah, he wouldn't. I love the guy, he wouldn't. So I said, okay, so I signed there. I'll pay him $100,000 or whatever it was if I ever tell about it. Now I'm out, they're flying me town to town opening phony accounts. And I say, but what are you going to do with these phony accounts? And he goes, you know what, we can't tell you. And I'll tell you why we can't tell you. Because if we tell you, these critics are really evil people. And they will get you in deposition for months. Which later I found is really what the Church of Scientology does. They get people in deposition for months and months and you grill them and everything else. But he said the critics were like that. And he goes, you don't want to be like that, right? And I said, no. And so he said, so we just won't tell you. Then you can say, I don't know. That's it. You won't be in deposition. So I say, okay, fair enough. So now I'm going town to town opening up phony accounts. I don't know what it is, but I grew up in Chicago, and I was around some of the mafia. And all of a sudden, this guy's this little skinny rat named Gavino, and he's like this Italian guy, and he's always like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And all of a sudden, I think, oh my God, I don't like David Miscavige by this point at all anyway. He'd done so many crummy things. And I think, maybe Miscavige hired a real hitman. You know, maybe this guy really is the mafia, right? How do I know? He would. He, by now, I've realized he's a criminal. He is. I've realized that. I don't think Scientology is at this point, but I think he is. And so I think I'm going to find out. So I go on the internet. Now I'm in my dining room, right? See, like they used to be able to control all this stuff, but now I'm in my dining room. And Bill had come, I forgot to tell you that, and taken off my net nanny. That's how I found out about it. Years earlier, he had said, oh, i got to take this thing off your computer. And I said, take what off? I just bought it, you know, just a little while ago. He explains the net nanny. And he says, but you know, you wanted it on there because you don't want to be talking to those evil people because they would upset you and then you have to get auditing or ethics and pay for it. And I'm like, yeah, true, okay. You know, that's how they handle that kind of stuff, right? So now I'm on there by myself and I go on there and I, Travolta, one, what happened was Travolta, Battlefield Earth came out. How many people saw that or heard about it? I mean, it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. We were in at the time and it was like, what a nightmare. So... I, feeling bad for John, I trained him. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go on the internet and I'll help his PR. So I'm on this little Yahoo message board. Mark is on it, calling himself Xenu, I think Xenu TV, right? And Xenu is a big confidential word. And I'm OT7. And it's like, you have to make sure that word isn't heard or you're going to be in trouble. So I'm like trying to call him the fat TV guy and everything else and trying to put him down and make, be mean to him. I was really nasty. Anyway, it wasn't working. These guys were like the cowboys. That's what they reminded me of, cowboys in the old days. You know, man, these guys could talk, they could think, they could ask questions, they could do everything I couldn't do, right? And I, and I missed that. And so I'm like, but I'm part of Scientology, so I call up Warner Brothers, and I say, you know what, I'm a mom, I'm a fan, and I'm really upset, because you've got all this religious junk on your, your message board, and I think you should take it down. And so... The guy says, okay, and I'm in sales, so I know how to get through to the right person. So I got through to this guy, right? And I say that, and I say, and I want you to report it. And he goes, okay. So the next day, this guy calls me. I'm from Time Warner, right, in New York. And we got your message, Tori Bizazian, and we were shutting down the Yahoo group. And I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. So I call up both, so hey, guess what? I got the thing shut down all by myself. So now it's shut down, and I sort of start missing these critics. 
So I'm just talking to them. I mean, they're like real people. You know, by the time you get up here, they're like these robots. You know, every per it was like the twilight zone for me. People would come up and say, hi, Tori. We just got back from Flag. We want to find out when you're going back again. And again, I'm like Homer Simpson going, not ever. Right? But I'm not saying anything. But it's like they were almost like in black and white, and I'm in color. It was really weird. It was a very strange phenomenon, right? It's like the Stepford Wives or something like that, when the color comes in, and I'm like, oh, this is weird. So now, I miss these critics. I miss talking to them. So then I think, well, maybe I could shut down ARS, which is a, this big, huge news group internationally, right? So I go on it. My name is Magoo. My dad's name was nick nicknamed Magoo. So I go on kind of as my dad, right? You know, I'm Magoo, right? And I'm like, back, 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 back. I'm fighting the critics, right? And these are people all around the world. And they're like, you know what? You're a moron. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, why do they call me a moron? You know, I don't get it. You know, it's like I've been with all these people who think I'm great. I'm at the top of this. I'm OT7, class four, OSA, you know, internet, OSA, I mean, OSA PR, everything else. I've had all this, like, I'm a great person, right? And now I'm around these people who are like, you're just a moron. You're an idiot. You know, and they're like writing all this to me. So I'm like fighting them back. I was on AOL at the time, and AOL, if you open it up, or at least the way, yeah, five more minutes. Okay, skip it. I'm not going to tell you. Anyway, basically, my friend in, in Norway, Andreas, writes me and says, what happened was I didn't know, I only knew how to copy-paste. That's how Bill Yardi had taught me. So I was copy-pasting things, and I would think how, how the Internet works for anybody who isn't on it. You say something, then there's some arrows, someone else says something, right? So basically, I think, who needs all these arrows? Right? So I'd erase all the arrows. And so Andreas in Norway writes me, who I think is the devil, and says, Magoo, nobody can understand you. You're not formatting this right. Here's what you need to do, X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, Flirt. I mean, this is the devil. And he's writing me, helping me? And at the end of every single thing he sends is his full name, his full address, and his phone number. And at the time, by the time we're at the top in the secret mafia, we're using phony names on the phone. I can't even say Bill. His name was Jack. You know, we're, we've got phony addresses, phony everything, right? And so I'm like, I just sit there stunned, and I write him back. And I, I mean, I was terrified, and I hit this blue link, and I go, why do you have up these horrible things about my religion? Send. You know, I'm writing to an SP. It's really heavy for me. And he writes back, and he says, Dear Magoo, I believe in truth. I believe in looking at both sides. And I believe in having the courage to say what I think. I don't think Scientology is bad, I just think it's misinformed. And I sat in my dining room and I cried for two hours. I couldn't stop crying. Because I thought, that is who I was when I got in at 22. That's what I believed in. And now I'm at the top of this pyramid and I can't think, I can't read, I can't talk, I've given them over $200,000 of all my inheritance, I'm nothing, right? And, you know, I'm not a critical thinker. It's bullshit, right? And I, I mean, it really like half the Truman Show cracks, right? But not all the way. And now I'm terrified. And I write Andreas and I say, I have no one to talk to. I can't walk into the church. All my friends are Scientologists. If I leave, I'm going to lose every person I know. And my husband of 27 years, I don't know if my soul can take it. And I send it to him. And I say, and I'm begging you not to tell anybody who I am because Osa is only 10 minutes away from me. They're here in Hollywood, right? And he says, um, he sends me back and he says, Dear Magoo, I'm crying reading your email. I'm really sorry you're having to go through this, but I have to ask you this question. What kind of friends could those be if they're going to leave you because you change your mind? <laughs> right? And that was it. The Truman Show cracked open. I probably cried for two more years. I mean, I was like so... Floored. I mean, I cried for four hours, and then I finally said, I announced it on the internet. Magoo left the building, and I just announced it. I said, Andreas, I got to go. My friends in Clearwater at the time had a center, and they were helping people get out or wake up or do whatever they could do. And um, before I say anything more, I want to say Mark Bunker has a lot of really cool videos that he has here today that you can get and buy that have a lot of this information on it and great videos, so, be, so I don't forget that. But he was in Florida with these people at the time. And Bob Minton, 
who was working there said, don't worry, we'll send you a ticket. Because Stacy, the person that was running it, said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm like so confused. I don't know what to do. And she said, do you want to just come here and rest for a week? And I said, okay. So Bob says, okay, we'll send you a ticket. Just go to LAX. Now, this is all confidential. Nobody knows this. Nobody knows this, right? So I, I get a van. I call the van. They say, okay, we'll be there tomorrow at 830. They don't show I call every van in the, in the yellow pages. They're all booked. Now, I don't know if Scientology did that or not, but it was pretty weird. And I can't call my friends and say I'm leaving Scientology, right? So I'm screwed. So anyway, finally, I'm just like, I'm making it to the airport. So I get to the airport. I walk into the, the terminal, and the plane has been canceled. Okay, now that's weird enough. And Stacy had said, bring a cell phone. And I said, oh, Stacy, you're exaggerating. You know, I'm like so in the blue on this thing. I have no clue how bad Scientology is at this time. I'm just against David Miscavige, and I'm leaving. So she says, bring a cell phone. So all of a sudden, the vice president of the Church of Scientology, Janet Weiland, walks up to me and says, Tori, what do you think you're doing? You are not going to Clearwater. We, or she says, we know where you're going. You're not going to see those people. And I'm floored. I'm like, how do you know I'm here? How do you know where I'm going? Get back. And I get on the cell phone, and I go, Stacy, she's here. And she goes, stay on the phone. Because she was at the top of the Church of Scientology, one of the executives, so she knows all this stuff. She goes, we know this drill. Don't set down the phone no matter what you do. We're walking you through this. You're getting on that plane. So I'm on the phone. Now the vice president's carrying my luggage as I, I have to get on another, I have to get on a van to go to another terminal. So she's carrying it. This is a true story. I get on. It's so embarrassing. I'm trying to find coins or whatever to get on this thing. And I say, look, I'm really sorry. I apologize for this, I'm escaping from a cult, and she's the vice president, and she won't leave me alone. Now, you'd think somebody at that point would go, all right, enough, you know, this is really bad PR, but no, no, she had to get all the information, right? I didn't know that. So she follows me all around. She won't leave me. She's writing down my new, all the whole schedule, like she's my sister. She's right next to me, right? So I get on the plane. Finally, Bob said, that's it, you know, because I said, she's right here. He goes, I'm getting you a first class ticket. You can go into a special thing. She can't get there. So I get in there. I get into the plane, and I literally, I'm like, oh, what a mess. Now, I've been up for like 48 hours. I'm like, I just can't believe this is going on. This is my church, right? You know, this is unbelievable. But it's okay. I'm out of here. I'm going to see my friends. We'll see what happens. So now, you got to hang on because i got to finish it. Now, <laughs> I, get to I get to Chicago to change planes, and my husband walks up in the airport. Tori, what are you doing? What are you thinking of? And I'm like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I just happen to be in the airport. And I'm like, yeah, right. That just happened. <laughs> So all of a sudden, that doesn't work. It doesn't fly. He wants me to go out in the, in the woods and take a vacation, which is their thing where they'll lock me up in a... I know they're going to lock me up in a, in a cabin and do weird things to me until I snap. But he doesn't know that. He was born in Scientology. So I know he doesn't know. He doesn't know about the secret mafia. He didn't know all the stuff I did because, remember, I promised I wouldn't tell. So I'm like, this is horrible. So I said, just get away from me. I'm going to see these people, and then we'll talk when I get back. Okay, so that happens. Then Office of Special Affairs shows up with a stack of papers you have to read, Tori, while you're on the plane, right? I'm like, I thought you just showed up here. Now Osa's here, right? So I get on the plane. I think, okay, I know the drill with Clearwater. They only go until midnight, so I'm fine. The plane arrives at 1.45. I'm wrong. There's like 8,000 people. Not really, but there's like 25 people there, my best friend jumping up and down. Tori, Tori, you've got to talk to me. So it's the Scientologists, the Office of Special Affairs, the police, and Stacy, Jesse, and Bob Minton are there. They're my new friends that are the big bad SPs. And the cops say, we can't decide. She has to decide. She has to make up her mind. Because they had called the police and said, she's going to call. They may try to snag her. Come help her. So I talked to my friend for two, two minutes. She says, I'm best friends with David Miscavige. I can get anything to him tonight. And I said, you know what? I picked them. <laughs> And that was it. I, you know, I could go on and on and on, but they ended up, you know, I was out. I wasn't going to speak out. I had told Stacy, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to do videos. I'm not going to do anything. But with the amount of fair game they have done with me, I am speaking out. I know five children who have killed themselves. Each of them either wanted out of Scientology or they had one parent in, one parent out. And their thing of disconnection where if you leave Scientology and you speak out, everyone disconnects from you. 
And I think I, the last child that did it was my son's best friend, and I promised him. I said, you're not going to die for nothing. And I was in Scientology at the time. But I think about him all the time, and I think, you know, I speak out for the young kids because I want them to know. If you want to get into it, you can get into it, but you should know what you're getting into. Study both sides. Read their side. Read the other side, and then make up your own mind. But at least then you're educated. Come to the Skeptic Society, right? Meet you people. You know what I mean? So there you go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it took too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it was okay? Thank you. Ah, oh, thank you. Are oh, you so sweet? Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of all you guys. It's like you saved me. You did. The critics truly gave me a new life. And thank you. I mean, it, it's you're welcome. Thank you.